But first, this podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. How about you? No, how about how about you? <laughs> How about you? <laughs> I thought I added an L in there. Yeah. Okay, oh. hold on. <laughs> okay, I'll just do that again. Oh my gosh. Okay. Mm-mm. Welcome back to the Modern Lady Podcast. You're listening to episode 111. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lindsay, and today we are talking about coming home. In the book, Theology of Home, authors Carrie Grass and Noelle Maring open their first chapter with this, quote, I'm home. There are few words sweeter to hear or say. There is nothing like a warm homecoming, end quote. As the weather grows colder and days shorter, we naturally begin to turn our gazes inward once again, to home and the desire to be there. But the intentional making of such a place is not exclusive to a season. It's a lifestyle and a mission. But first, this podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. How about you? Do you want more from the modern lady? Become a Patreon supporter and for just $5 a month, you will have access to extra content. Find us by going to patreon.com forward slash the modern lady podcast. You can also support the show by giving us a rating and review on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews, especially on iTunes, can really help others who might be interested find our podcast too. Your comments mean the world to us. This week's shout out goes to listener Rose, who left us a review on Podbean and said, quote, Dear Michelle and Lindsay, thank you so much for your dedication to this podcast. You are both so wise and insightful, and I always come away from listening to your podcast with so many things to ponder. Thank you for sharing yourselves in such a deep way, end quote. Well, thank you so much, Rose, for your comment. It makes us so happy to know that you are enjoying the show and come away from the episodes with new things to ponder. And if you would like to leave us a comment, you can do so on our website www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com or you can leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. But before we get into today's chat, Lindsay has our Modern Lady Tip of the Week. Well, this week our tip isn't so much a tip as a little bit of interesting trivia. Throughout domestic history, there have been little items that people keep around their homes that are believed to bring some good luck. One of these items is the classic tomato-shaped pin cushion. Perhaps you've seen one at your mother's or your grandmother's, and maybe you even own one. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a stuffed piece of red fabric in the shape and style of a tomato, and you stick your sewing pins into it. According to MarthaStewart.com, tomato pincushion dates back to Victorian times. However, pincushions in general go all the way back to the Middle Ages. They weren't just practical, meaning they weren't just a way to store sharp needles so that people didn't accidentally get poked. They were a way to display your pins and needles because those were expensive items. So why a tomato? Tradition has it that placing a tomato on the fireplace mantle of a new home will ward off evil spirits. The history of the tomato is wild. Known often as the poison apple, it was mostly feared until the mid 1800s as many people believed that you would get very sick and possibly die if you ate one. We now know about the toxic reaction that happens when tomatoes are served on pewter, which was very common on dining tables throughout history. Pewter is high in lead and the acidity of the tomatoes would pull the lead from the plates and people would ingest high lead levels. It was hard to find why tomatoes were believed to ward off evil spirits. Perhaps the spirits would be drawn to the tomato on the mantle and leave the rest of the home alone. Pin cushions in general became a highly collectible item in a Victorian woman's parlor. She would have shelves lined with them, all different shapes and sizes, embroidered in great detail and stuck all over with beautiful pins. I can barely sew a button on or mend a tear, but my pins are stuck in a very sweet little gift that I received 20 years ago from a friend. She made me a small sewing kit using a mason jar with the pin cushion stuck into the ring part of the mason jar lid. I still use it and think of her every time I pull it out. 
Mm-hmm. Now I've sent you something, Lindsay. Mm, you tell right me now? if you've yeah, right now as <laughs> okay. in real time. In real time. You tell me if you've Ooh, gotten the technology. It. Okay, in text. Yes. In text. Yes. Okay. Just waiting. Oh, okay. here. Oh, hold on. Michelle, you have one. <laughs> you, you just had it near you. <laughs> yep. Whoa. So for those who cannot see in this not visual medium, I'm <laughs> posing. In my picture right now with my tomato pin cushion, <gasps> no which I do way. keep in my closet where we record our episodes. <laughs> <laughs> so did you know the yes. history of your tomato pin cushion? I had no idea. And I only, wow. uh, I just considered it normal because my mother had a tomato pin mm-hmm. cushion and her mother before her had one. <laughs> but this is fascinating. And I just, I kind of love that you know, someone had to sit there and think about this. Like if it was mm-hmm. me coming up with a pin cushion idea, <laughs> I would have just found something soft to stick pins in. But <laughs> yes. someone had to like deliberately make this into a red ball yeah. and actually sew like the detailing of the stem of the tomato and everything. <laughs> like yep. it was a very intentional thing. But um, I also did not know that pins used to be such a status symbol. Mm-hmm. They were... They were, and so many of them were so delicate and beautiful with like decorative things on the ends. So again, it just, it makes me so excited as we look around our houses, right? The history Mm -hmm. of everyday objects um, and just little items. So, oh, that makes me so happy that you have one. That feeling of walking through your front door at the end of the day is difficult to put into any words other than simply, ah. There are so many important aspects to the home and of homemaking that we talk about here on the podcast, but that moment of homecoming is one that is especially powerful, isn't it, Lindsay? Yes, and I have to say that you introduced me to the word homecoming, and we mean this Mm. differently as Canadians, right? We don't have homecoming dances and stuff like y'all do in the (laughs) States, so we just, yeah, we don't even associate it with that, but you were talking to me, trying to help me with my fears and anxiety of sending my kids back to school by reminding Mm. me that I could focus and pour my attention and energy into their homecoming every day, right? And that really Mm. did get me excited about the idea of them coming home. Like we know with so many things in life, sometimes you have to miss things in order to be excited for them again. And it's yes. sometimes harder for us as the people who never actually leave our homes um, yeah. to be excited <laughs> for homecoming. But it is a gift that we really can give to our children if they happen to go to school outside of the home or, um, or to our, our husbands, right, when they come home. So homecoming, mm-hmm. when you said that to me, it was that great little reminder of the gift that I can give. Mm-hmm. And f- conversely, for us, we're homeschooling this year. Mm-hmm. And I've told you that the homecoming is actually <laughs> probably the biggest thing that I actually miss about yes. sending my kids to school. I just remember basically from the moment I would drop them off at school in the morning, it seemed like the rest of the day was preparing for them to come back again. Yes. And I miss that ritual. It is really striking. So when I think of homes, I always think of the word threshold. And I love that word. I love the idea of us having control over who and what comes over the thresholds into our homes. And I will say that we did a whole episode on that um, called the Mm -hmm. home guard, right? Home guard for the holidays. I think we did it, um, you know, in relation to Christmas prep. (laughs) Home guard for the holidays. (laughs) Those are all you. (laughs) We'll just let people know right now they're all you. Um, (laughs) So if people want more information on that concept of guarding the threshold, definitely check out our home guard episode because right now when I'm going to go down a different path, because when I started just Googling Mm. threshold, I came across the origin story for a very familiar tradition of carrying the bride across the threshold. And I'm not sure if, are you familiar with the origin stories of that? Why we do that? No, not at all. Okay. There are three main origin stories, and the first one really centers around keeping the woman away from evil um, and keeping evil Mm. away from the newly married couple. Now, women were seen as more susceptible to evil. We know we think back to Eve in the garden. And so in order to protect the new wife and therefore the new home, things were placed around the wedding ceremony under her feet so that her feet were separated from the floor. I guess with the floor Hmm. maybe being associated with the depths of hell. This is where also the runner down the aisle at the church comes from. 
why her, why her oh. feet it's not just decorative and also if you didn't have that they would strew like have flowers strewn around the, mm-hmm. um, that area right it's just anything to kind of separate her feet from the floor so then if you believe that if you believe that evil can like enter into the bride through the floor uh it would make sense then that you would carry her across the threshold mm. into the new home right wow now, the next one, this is a little darker, believe it or not, um, but with so many arranged marriages, they believed or they would say like the woman would physically have to be carried into the home and into the bed chamber mm. because maybe she was unwilling to marry the man. So that was another one that pops up when you start to research this. And the last one is just simply that they believed it was a bad omen if the woman fell on her wedding day. Now, this would probably happen to me. I fall everywhere. I am <laughs> the klutziest <laughs> person. So perhaps I should have just been carried up the aisle and into my home. But yeah, that it would be a bad omen if she fell on and hurt herself right on her wedding day. So carrying mm-hmm. her into the new home would help keep her safe. Hmm. I love that. I love that the very first instance of mm-hmm. uh, married couples and therefore a new family's entry into their home, their homecoming, yeah. um, is rooted in exactly what we try to maintain today, like yeah. protection of the family, um, safeguarding of yes. the people that are placed in your care. And I love that that ritual, especially the first one, yeah. I'll go with the first one yeah. of, <laughs> of caring so much, the husband caring so much for his wife that he would carry her to where it was safe. Yes, because mm-hmm. we, you know... As, as archaic as some of that sounds, you and I both personally still believe that there is evil and that evil can enter our homes, right? And so we still mm-hmm. do things to protect our families from that. So I think that too, because it's like really starting out on the wrong foot if you're bringing that into the home, yeah. right? And I love the idea that the woman can, well, they believe bring in the evil, but also on the flip side that we believe that we have the potential to protect our families, right? We don't Mm -hmm. need to look at it in the negative, but on the flip side that we can protect our families from that. So yeah, I thought that that was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And in that same vein, there is the Jewish tradition of the mezuzah. Do you know about the mezuzah? Oh, uh, this does sound familiar, but I'll I'll need you to refresh my memory. <laughs> okay, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, but you've perhaps seen, and if you haven't up till now, you'll notice it if you go to Jewish homes, the small piece of parchment, and it's been rolled up, and it's in like a protective, usually just like um, plastic frame, but mm-hmm. it's rolled up, and it's, it's hung on their doorways, and this is according to a commandment in Deuteronomy. Um, it's handwritten, it has to be handwritten Hebrew letters, and it has a passage, usually 20 two, I believe, lines long. And again, it's a passage from Deuteronomy that starts with, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Um, And it is to remind the occupants of the home every time they enter or leave that they are in a covenantal relationship with God and that this dwelling is a religious dwelling. It's a it's a sacred space. Hmm. And now, according to the website, myjewishlearning.com, it says, quote, a Jewish household is created by people who live in it by the way they act, the things they do and don't do, and the beliefs they hold. Now, what's so fascinating about the Jewish people is that it is a portable religion in some senses. And I'm getting this from their own texts. This isn't my Mm. thoughts. They understand that there are people who went through Exodus, right? That there have been great periods of migration. Um, And so they understand that while they create this idea of a home and that it is a sacred space that is meant to be protected, um, that that home really is the people who live in it. And that at any time, if it's fully formed, it can be moved and the whole sense of home is kept intact. Mm hmm. I think that is really important to note that, you know, we spend a lot of time taking care of the physical aspects of the home. Mm -hmm. But I mean, all of that without the heart uh, behind it, it really just is four walls. That's right. (laughs) Right. And so I really love that that's like so ingrained even in their philosophy and even in the um, like religious sentiment of the Jewish people that this heart of home um, is the critical part and everything flows from the inside to the outward expression of it. 
Yeah. And you know, it just got me thinking about what's written over my doorway and it's still visible because we have a porch that protects it from the rain is and what's probably written over your doorway. What we do as mm-hmm. Catholics with the epiphany so. blessing, yep. right? Yes. Um, yep. So for our listeners who aren't Catholic on the feast day of the epiphany, um, my husband gets up with blessed chalk, blessed by a priest. And he writes, um, you know, a blessing above the door using the three first initials of the three wise men and then the year. And it, I forget that people who aren't Catholic might be like, um, what's above your door? <laughs> like, yeah. what is the chalk <laughs> scribblings that's half worn off above your door? But it's written over every doorway into our home. And so I forget that we actually still have our own version of that ritual. And as a funny aside, I'll have to just share this right now. Um, My dad didn't know that my mom was doing that on their cottage. And so he thought somebody had tagged their home for some kind of like future crime (laughs) or something. It like freaked him right out. And he was agonizing over how to tell my mom that there were these strange markings above their door. And he called her from the cottage. He's like, I'm so sorry, Patty. I'm really worried about something. And he tells her and she burst out laughing. She's like, oh, that's Lindsay and Jason told me to write that above our door to protect the cottage. (laughs) That's amazing. I was going to say it does look a little bit cipher-ish. It does. It does. It does look like a code for something. Yeah. Well, and and even in this Jewish tradition, they're quick to point out that it's not an amulet. We don't look at these things as like special magic, right? But Mm -hmm. it is a reminder for those in the home every time that you cross in or out that this is a a place that is marked separately from the world, right? Mm -hmm. And that what Mm -hmm. goes on inside of it isn't ruled or dictated by what's going on outside of it. That it is a place that is completely unique and special and that is worthy of of our attention, our intentions, and our protection. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love that reminder that home is the central part of mm-hmm. the central place of our lives. It's the resting place where we all come back home to, right? Mm-hmm. And so it should follow that it takes up the majority of our attention and focus and intention. Mm-hmm. Though sometimes I think culturally we can kind of get away from that a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about how you and I are both, you know, stay at home moms. And so we are home all day. And I'm Mm -hmm. used to being home all day. It's been kind of thrust upon you (laughs) due to the circumstances (laughs) of the last year and a half. But um, we don't really have the chance to come home in the same way that perhaps our husbands do. Um, That being said, I want to reiterate again that we have always said on this podcast that we believe a homemaker is anyone with a home. That we don't mean Mm -hmm. that it's just the stay at home moms or the, the, the stay at home wives that are homemakers. We firmly believe that if you have a home, you are a homemaker. You have the potential and the power to do the same things that you and I do. We just have a little mm-hmm. bit more time, right? The yes. luxury of time to do these things. So when we look at that now and we think about people coming into our homes and we're going to keep it small, like our children and our husbands or our spouses, um, w- let's look at the process <laughs> that is like kind of the unwinding process that takes them from school or work and into the home. And what does that look like and how can we help them unwind? And just one more point, you know, before we really take a look at what homecoming can look like in a tangible way, I was looking a little bit further too into what it means to have a haven, because we Mm -hmm. often also talk about that concept too, right? Mm -hmm. About how your home becomes a place of safety and refuge for everybody from your home, right? And so the def that's the definition of what a haven is. Um, In regards to ships and boats, it's that inlet or the harbor that provides shelter from storms and everything like that. And so if you think about what your family does on a day-to-day basis, we go out into the world in various aspects, whether it's to work or to school or to run errands, what have you, and you need a place to come back at the end of it all. And so what do you want to walk back into when you come home? That, I think, is the core intentional message of homecoming is Mm -hmm. thinking ahead to what's going to be your first point of contact when you walk back through that threshold into your home again. So the next thing we want to look at are the people who are coming home. This is where we think about our spouses who have to go out into the world if they haven't been able to work from home or kids if they go to school. And you and I thought it was interesting to really look into the unwinding process that has to happen Mm -hmm. in that transition period from them coming in from their stressful days and in a very stressful world into the home, the homecoming moment, um, into the home that we've created. So Michelle, 
let's talk about the unwinding process now. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) What have we learned about that? Well, you know what? It's interesting because I just discovered the Simplicity Parenting podcast um, by author Kim John Payne, who we've mentioned before, who actually wrote the book Simplicity Parenting. And uh, he was talking in one particular episode about establishing rhythms to coming home and how Mm. it's crucial to transitioning um, into the relaxing home atmosphere after school. And he was saying that children in particular need help envisioning the big picture of their day. That part Mm -hmm. of their brain isn't uh, formed yet the younger you go. So you can help facilitate this by providing them predictable rhythms that will help them visualize what's coming next. And this is going to help them reduce stress and anxiety. So it got me thinking about how when you're considering the children aspect of homecoming, and I go back to my own childhood with this too, is that I knew I was going home and I knew what it looked like at home, like what I was going to come back into. Mm -hmm. The stability and the predictability of it really did give me confidence because I knew that no matter what was happening throughout the rest of the day, if it was a rough day, that all I had to do was get to 3.30 in the afternoon and then I could go home. And and then I knew what I was walking back into. So I think that part of the unwinding process for people coming home is uh, the predictability of routine and rhythm of setting up your home to be a place where people know what's coming next and what to expect. Okay, I love that. And you're making me reflect back to, you know, during my high school years, it was my dad home when I got home from um, from school. And I loved those long conversations I'd get into with my dad. We'd have like an hour and a Mm -hmm. half conversation and they would get pretty heated because we're very, very similar. And so it wasn't my mom. She would, my dad would actually start dinner and have everything tidy and he would get that all ready for when my mom would come home from work. So it was a little unorthodox at that time. His job just ended earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, like you're saying, I did always look forward to coming home and having that time with my dad. And you know what's so interesting about your memories of homecoming and mine, which Mm -hmm. is essentially like what you were saying, it was snack time Mm -hmm. with mom, even down to the predictability of we had two cookies and a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. That was snack every single day, Mm -hmm. right? And that mom would watch Murder, She Wrote and Magnum (laughs) P.I. Like that was every day. (laughs) Yes. Uh, But what's so interesting about that is that it was, it's nothing really extraordinary, Yes, And I think that was the biggest takeaway for me, too, is that it doesn't have to be something we overanalyze in its minute details, just that we intentionally want to do it in general. And so, you know, I love that. I see that manifested so much in our childhood memories of after school routines. Yeah. And like your mom was obviously taking a break to watch her shows at that time, which, in mm-hmm. you know, and we've talked about this actually before, is that we know that your mom would have done her work, had it done yeah. for that time, sorry, so she could be available, but also so she could relax before she had to get onto the second part of her day. Yes. Um, and then when I look at my dad, he, some of the times we would just sit and talk, but then he'd have to get dinner going. So yeah, it didn't mm-hmm. break the routine necessarily. Like he kept working, but he was just there. He was present. Like you said, it wasn't anything extraordinary. It was just mm-hmm. being being present and available and um, consistent, that con- that yes. constancy that that home is. Um, I was looking into kids coming home from school and my kids have always been mostly okay when they come home from school, but I know that that's not the case with everybody. And I came across something called restraint collapse. And mm. it's a term that's been coined by a London, Ontario counselor named Andrea Lowen Nair. Mm -hmm. And this is when, and and perhaps you know about this, Michelle, but it's when you hear from your child's teacher or daycare provider, um, how great the kid was all day, right? How sweet they were, how well they listened, but then they come home to you and they're having total meltdowns and they're not Mm -hmm. listening. Um, and you're just like, what the heck? Like, were they really Mm -hmm. talking about my kid? Cause that's not how they act at home. Now, parent educator and psychologist, Vanessa LaPointe said to today's parent magazine, quote, More sensitive and intense kids and kids struggling with learning and social skills will be more likely affected by this. Um, So kids learn early on what they need to do in order to, quote, be good in school, right? Mm. And it can be exhausting for them. And the bubble will burst when they eventually come home and feel like they can express themselves in a safe way. But this is interesting because 
it's more than just exhaustion though. There is another deeper level to this that the psychologists were talking about and it's called defensive detachment. And mm. this is when kids feel that they really needed their parent at some point during the day when they were away from them and their parent simply wasn't there, right? Because they just mm. can't be. Mm -hmm. And when they see their parent, there's an immediate sense of love filled relief but then this anger creeps in that they don't even realize they're feeling and they do lash out a little bit and they're not in control of this. And the way the psychologists compared this, they said, it's like if you've lost your child for a minute or two at the grocery store and then mm. you reconnected with them and you have that overwhelming sense of relief and love. And then their anger. Sometimes you get a little like, why weren't yeah. you listening? Why'd you go over there? Right? So mm -hmm. it's like this huge amount of emotions <laughs> that are just rising to the surface in our children um, at the end of every single day. And I think it's so important that we learn how to deal with this with our, our children and teach them how to work through these feelings so that they already have that in place for when they become adults, because we'll look at the adult part next. But right, all of this lays that groundwork for how they're going to cope when they come home from work as adults. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting. I didn't I didn't know that there was like even psychological terms for that mm -hmm. feeling, but I do know. Uh, I can see that feeling and that picture that. And I wonder if, again, one of the things that we can be intentional about to help with that transition in the unwinding process when people get home is to be uh, all in, mm. <laughs> in terms of our attention and focus. Yeah. You know, like sometimes um, people don't want to share as soon as they walk in the door, everything that happened to them that day. Yes. I know you and I don't have that problem. Yes. <laughs> We walk in and immediately want to <laughs> tell everyone all the yep. things. Yep. But there are some people who are not like us. <laughs> yes. I know. In, weird, eh? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Especially in regards to our kids and, yeah. and our husbands, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. And I think that um, there's probably two approaches to this. Number one is giving them space. Mm -hmm. So not uh, forcing that sharing on them, right? Uh, yeah. Not expecting that. Um, we give them time and space to process things. And then the second thing is, is that when they are ready to sh share and open up, I know that for me, it would be difficult not to try to reframe what they're saying as they're saying it into yeah. what I think their day should have been like. <laughs> yeah. And to just listen, right? And just hear what they're saying and what they're sharing. And then in that way, I wonder if you reestablish yourself as their ally as yes. their friend right so not only are you coming back into a physical space where once again they can feel safe because they belong and this is where they're supposed to be but that also the people there are their people and yes. you reestablish that again and that I think really helps with the unwinding transition of coming home and another aspect too I think is um having to control yourself so that you're not brought into their stress. You're not brought into yes. their storm of emotions, right? You have mm -hmm. to remain solid during that. And so you can't be triggered by the kids if they're having a meltdown. And even these psychologists were saying, this isn't the same as a temper tantrum. This isn't necessarily something that needs to even be mm. disciplined, right? But it's re really, really important that you remain calm, the beacon of peace, which mm. my priest keeps <laughs> telling me to be, which <laughs> is really hard, uh, a beacon of peace, um, but that you remain constant again and patient and kind everything you're saying just remain you and then they'll come up to your level instead of you going mm -hmm. down to their level one really an interesting thing is i guess somebody had asked the psychologist about screen time for their kids after school if that can you know help them calm down and she said that mm -hmm. that can work but it really should be a last resort that human connection must always be mm -hmm. first mhm mm um, yes, yeah, screen time is super interesting. And I'll get to that in a minute. But what you said about being the beacon of peace, mm -hmm. right, and being solid, that really does remind me of what my mom has, has always practiced, but then also counseled me on as I became a parent too, is that your kids will make a big deal over whatever you make a big deal over. Mm -hmm. And I remember her doing this then in practice to me when I was a kid, even with the things I would brought home, I would bring home from school. If I was upset about something, she did not dismiss what I was thinking or saying or feeling. But I remember finding great solace in that the things that seemed to shake my world did not appear to shake hers. Right. Yes. And that because I was home with her 
then I could feel that way too. You know, and so our reactions to things and our perspectives on them, I think, can rub off on other people. And it doesn't mean that we might have to go and deal with it later. Uh, because I know in practice with my own kids, there have been times where I've put that into practice, but what they say has maybe upset me or caused me to pause and think for a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, But those two things don't have to happen at the same time. And then just one point about the screens that you were making. Um, Mm -hmm. That's interesting too, because a lot of my after-school memories was watching TV shows, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's probably similar to many people's memories and experiences. However, it always happened after that snack time Mm -hmm. with mom. Yeah, right? the human so connection I, first. Yes. Yeah. So I find that really interesting that maybe it can help with decompressing for sure. We zone out yeah. with a TV show at the end of our days, um, but not until after you've made that point of contact. Okay. So now I think about my husband. Okay. So let's pretend the kids are home. They've had a snack. <laughs> They're now on their screens <laughs> and then husband comes home. Um, now you guys know my husband has a high stress job. He's a police detective and he's recently been moved into major crime, which is the homicide division. And so it is even more stressful <laughs> than any mm. of the other parts of policing he has done up until now. And so that's a, a really unique situation where we have an agreement between us as husband and wife that there is nothing um, that he can't tell me, right? That's that's mm. a different thing in his job where we need to have that in place um, and that I'm always available to listen. But aside from that, there is actually some apparently biological things hardwired into men about how they need to relax differently than women after work. Now, I got this from mm. John Gray, and he is the author of the famous book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Ah, yes. (laughs) The book, right? I know when this book came out, it was on my mom's nightstand and she doesn't even like to read. And on every woman's house, that book was everywhere. I don't know how many men read it, but women did. And John Gray was interviewed on the Suzanne Venker show. And we've talked about her before. And I love her and a lot of her messages are, you know, can seem controversial out in the secular world and, and his too. But he brought up this fascinating thing about how men's brains are wired to relax after work. And he links that back to, you know, the ancestral hunter gatherer days and how when a man would have to go out and slay a beast that took so much of their strength and mental, you Mm. know, prowess that they, in order to do that again, the next day to kill another animal for their family or to go look for food, They had to completely do nothing for a little Mm. while in between the hunts. Like they actually had to stop thinking and men are capable of doing that. But this is actually the way that their brain shuts down, calms down so that they can rise to that level again, because they simply cannot stay at that high stress level all the time. Right. Or they'll Mm -hmm. die. They won't be able to hunt the next day. Now he goes on to say that women don't have a shut off in their brain that says danger, danger. You're stressed out. You've hit, you've hit your level. This is why. Tell me something. I don't know. know, Right. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) He said women will, and we know this work until we physically collapse, right? Until Mm. you physically can't move. Like we will push ourselves to the absolute limit. Now we're not saying that this is a good thing or a bad thing. Like we're not, we're not weighing in Mm -hmm. on, on that, on the morals of that. We're just saying that I guess our bodies have been hardwired to perform our duties since the beginning of time in a very different way. So this comes back to the idea, if we think back to the leave it to beaver days, right. Of Ward Cleaver coming home and her handing him his pipe and slippers. And, and we all Mm. laugh about this, but he would read the newspaper as she was cooking dinner. Now, Jason's dad, my husband's father was born in 1931. Okay. So he was of that era. And Jason really remembers his dad coming home and not being talked to for the first hour. Like it was like, let dad unwind and watch the news and be quiet. Now we Mm -hmm. might have a lot of very modern feelings about that, you know, that immediately creep into our heads. And, and, and I do as well. And as the woman who's been home all day with all the children and homeschooling, right? Like it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to process this idea of going, no, no, they get this quiet time to themselves while we're still (sighs) at the most hectic part of our day. But 
all of this Mm -hmm. to say that I think that still taking in this information is important and to understand how their brains work, how our brains work and thinking maybe there is a day or two a week where I can experiment with this in our house where without him even knowing I can say, Hey, why don't you go upstairs for an hour while Mm -hmm. I just get supper started and I'll call you down and just see how that changes. Maybe your husband's productivity levels for the rest of the night or how you're able to connect with him once he's had this time to unwind. Um, you know, it's, we're just saying here, take this in, try it, maybe don't try it. You can laugh it off. But (laughs) I found that to be really, really interesting about how a man's brain needs to actually shut down like that. And, Mm -hmm. and then that being said, and I will say this, Michelle, I know I'm saying a lot, but I will say that this is not at the expense of your own health and your own mental health. Part of this too, and the hardest part is having to identify throughout your day where you can carve out rest for yourself, where you can make sure that you are not falling collapsed on the couch at 11 after doing all the work, right? Like you Mm -hmm. also have to look inward and to see how can I make sure I'm in the best place mentally, emotionally, physically, so that I can gift this to everybody else. Yeah. And that you hit the nail on the head right there is gift right? Mm -hmm. So that's what it's all supposed to be um, from both the men and the women's side. Um, But in in particular, in this context of uh, when husbands come home from work and gifting them that time, it it isn't out of some, you know, dutiful obligation that you're doing something like that. It's meant to be a gift. And then conversely, it's also supposed to be a gift coming back at you um, to notice when you are also tired and need a break. And I think that's probably how it's supposed to work. And I know it probably looks different for all the families. But I know that for me, um, for me, it's stressful if I know that Phil's coming home from work and he's stressed out and then he feels he needs to jump right in Mm -hmm. and help me with my my things um, to finish getting dinner on the table, to see the kids, to try to, you know, cram in as much time as possible playing with the kids. And I would sometimes much rather know that he is taking that time to rest so that he can come down refreshed afterwards too and things are just a bit more calm. And so, yeah, I... I can totally understand the need to have some time to transition. And that makes sense that men and women would be, um, would need that maybe at different times of the day yes. but to be aware that the need still exists, even yeah. though it's not the same for, for both. Because look again to your mom with Murder, She Wrote or Magnum, right? Like yeah. she took that time in absolute yes, quiet she and solitude. She had that. Mm-hmm. And so we, if we aren't giving that to ourselves, then that's on us. Like I, I know that mm-hmm. I can plan my day out well and give myself that hour um, when, when, you know, of uninterrupted time. So not to put it all then on ourselves, some of that responsibility does fall on the person who is working, whether that's you or your spouse or both of you. Um, some of that trans uh, transition time, there are things you can do on your commute home, whether you're you know on a bus or you're driving yourself home. There are some things you can do yourself to be proactive about already starting that unwinding process so that you can switch gears better. And so you have two choices when you're leaving work. You can go home as you're going home, continue to go over your day in your head, deadlines that you missed, you know, the coworker that's getting under your skin and you can continue to um, just marinate (laughs) in that stress. Or Mm -hmm. you can have practices and routines in place already for that time that help you start to unwind. So whether you listen to the rosary in the car on the way home or a meditation um, or a podcast that you really enjoy, I think the people who are coming home need to think about that as well and think what can they do on their drive home so that they're not also bringing in all of that stress because Mm. stress is contagious. Mm -hmm. Because I guess at the end of the day, we talk a lot about the homemaker and Mm -hmm. for the two of us, we find that to be the primary um, use of our time right now as the homemaker. Um, but the home is comprised of more people than just us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a team effort, really. Yep. It'll come as no surprise to everyone just how much I love my Scandinavian traditions. Oh, and I say my like I'm Scandinavian. I'm not at all. I couldn't be more Irish, but um, not Scandinavian. Not Scandinavian. No, <laughs> I'm like, good. I'm so UK. But um, this one is one of my 
favorites and it has a really interesting origin. Um, so there's something called, and I apologize already for my pronunciation, but Fredegsmus. Fredegsmus. Well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Follow along. Um, and it, that I think it comes with the word Friday. Right. It does. It's, oh, so it's, okay. um, Fredeg is Friday and Miss is kind of like another Swedish version of like Huga, which just means like, um, like a gathering together of people. Mm -hmm. And so they combine those two things, Fridays and Miss, the coziness, um, into Fredegs Miss. Um, and it became a marketing ploy for a potato chip company that created this concept in Sweden oh. to sell chips. Uh, I also love chips. So this works so well. Um, <laughs> this was their marketing in the 1990s. And it was all about unwinding with your family over board games and snacks, mm. right? And chips. Um, mm -hmm. And it was... <laughs> It also became their taco day. So instead of taco Tuesday, which is frankly much catchier than taco, but I digs must, um, yeah. it's just was their time to have the like, snack foods and games and stuff. Right. So, but it's mm -hmm. all about it being on Friday, the end of the work week. Now the Swedes love home. Oh, so yeah. many other traditions involve home and creating little rituals at home. And so I guess their big thing used to be Sunday dinners, like so many places. And then that moved kind of like to a Saturday gathering of, fam of family. But now it's really moved on to Fridays mm. for them. And part of me, although we really observe the Sunday rest and yet Sunday feasting, I find that really hard to do as a Catholic woman to mm. rest, but also feast on Sundays and to do all the work involved with that. So I kind of really yeah. love this idea of maybe having like mom's relaxing day as the Friday night um, mm. with family. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is one third of Swedes um, do this every Friday, but 78% do it um, monthly. So one third do it every week, but a oh. whopping 78% really do observe this um, at least on a monthly basis. So Fredegsmus um, is your new Friday night tradition, Michelle. I know you guys do Friday movie mm -hmm. night now. You just have yeah. a more fun name for it. <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> I'm like, I feel like I do that, although not with chips. And no, so you do yeah, I need to get, what? oh, well, there you go. No, well, popcorn for right. movies, right. but I am seeing the common theme of homecoming equals snacks. Yes. So <laughs> yes. I think that's the first step. If you want to start embracing, um, making homecoming really intentional is look the person in the eye and give them food. Yes, <laughs> there yes. goes your two-step beginners program. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I love that because on Friday you really do associate that with putting the work week behind you, mm -hmm. right? And that's basically what we've been saying with this episode on a daily basis is that you're leaving the world behind you and you're coming home at the end yes. of the day. And so it makes a lot of natural sense for it to be Friday. And I'm all for doing like a mini Sunday's rest, but on Friday mm -hmm. because it does feel like you've wrapped up more on a Friday afternoon than you have for Sunday for some reason. It's a we different can explore intention. that later. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah, different thing, yeah. right? I feel like it is a different intention. I feel like a Friday is more celebratory and like we've made yes. it through, but we know Sunday, and we've talked about this on other episodes, Sunday is really about a time to um, build deeper family connections, to give your day back to God, to make it a different type, uh, to really make that day sacred and holy and a different way that refreshes your soul. But maybe because mm -hmm. we are body and soul, I think the oh, chips, yes. right? The chips. Yeah. And the Take fun care time of the, on the body. Fridays. It's the body day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I love that. Just the the act of coming home, which reminds me of another international um practice that mm -hmm. involves homecoming that you introduced me to a few years ago, mm -hmm. which is kuri, mm -hmm. right? Or kuri. Yes. Um, <laughs> It's a Scots word, a Scottish yeah. word. Uh, and the definition is, you know, to crouch or stoop down for protection or to cuddle and snuggle. And then you can pair it with doon to sound, <laughs> you know, especially Scottish with kuri doon, um, settle in, yes. uh, cozy down, right? Cozy down. And what I love really about this, though, is that it is linked to the actual act of coming back in. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to huga, or maybe in addition to huga, where it kind of implies that you're already in. Yes, yes. <laughs> kuri 
all includes the act of walking over that threshold, coming into your own house and that cozy feeling that you associate with walking in. And so I've, I was telling you, I think that's my huga that I love cozying down, but it is so much sweeter when you have been out and it's that homecoming that really marries the two aspects of life into one complete concept. And what I love about Kuri is that it, it's even made more powerful if the weather outside is terrible that you're leaving, right? And so mm-hmm. we can talk about the, and that, I mean, again, think about the Scottish Highlands, right? Like think about the pelting, driving rain and the winds and the snow and, and all that, and then coming into that space. And then think about that just like symbolically with the world right now and everything that mm-hmm. is being hurled at the people that we love the most our husbands are out there fighting battles that we can't even understand no matter what job they're in because mm-hmm. i frankly don't have to do that and our children too in school there are so many things that they might not ever open up to us about that they worried about or that they struggled with that day and so what makes that homecoming even sweeter is the fact that they did have these battles outside so whether it's bad weather or just things that they're having to struggle with inside their little hearts um, that it's made even more precious when they come back into the warmth and beauty of a home that we have set out with intention for them that we have worked and created this space that it just is like a loving hug around them when they come in from the outside world Okay, it's time for our What We're Loving This Week segment of the show. So Lindsay, what have you been loving this week? Okay, this week's a little different because it's not so much a specific recommendation. Um, Rather, I just will share that I've really enjoyed three different movies over the last three weekends with my family. And you'll notice a theme here. Um, We watched Interstellar, The Martian, and Mm -hmm. Arrival. So Mm -hmm. surprise, surprise, Mm -hmm. I'm not really a space movie type of person. (laughs) You didn't know that about me. (laughs) But my son Deacon is, right? And I feel like if the teenager Mm. wants to watch something as a family, then you just say yes, no matter what. So um, Mm -hmm. we watched them. Now, I will say for the most part, they were all family friendly. Um, There's a little bit more swearing in The Martian, but even less so in the other two. Have you seen all three, Michelle? Yes, I have seen all three. Okay. They're really good. They are really good. And (laughs) Mm -hmm. my favorite thing with all of them is that despite the fact that they're about space and like aliens and stuff, they're about the human connection, right? which really takes us even back to the episode we just filmed. Um, In Interstellar, it's about fatherhood, right? The power of fatherhood and the grandfather, Mm. but particularly the father-daughter relationship. Um, In The Martian, it was about friendship, right? And like Mm. not leaving somebody behind and then the whole country and then the whole world getting behind this one man. And I thought that Mm. was fascinating. But my favorite was Arrival because I felt like it was a bit more artistic, right? It's a Canadian director and it was filmed in Quebec. I don't know if you knew that. And Mm. it's about Mm. mother daughter and I won't give it any away, uh, any details about how the mother daughter relationship works in the film, but it's very emotional and it's just beautiful and really well done. So I was just thinking these were just cheesy movies about space, but surprise, surprise, it was all about human relationships. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. The sci-fi genre is actually really good for that. Mm. I feel like, and I remember seeing someone write about it. Um, at some point is that sci-fi is a great medium to go deeper into Mm. those more heartfelt topics because on a realistic level it kind of suspends your realism if that makes sense so that people don't find it as threatening maybe to explore some of these deeper heart issues when you put it against the backdrop of a sci-fi genre oh well maybe i'll have to watch more (laughs) sci-fi who would have seen this coming (laughs) well i'm just i'm just saying that your son may enjoy doctor who (laughs) which still trying is also very relational (laughs) i will beat that drum forever i'm a whovian for life yes (laughs) (laughs) that is awesome well what have you been loving this past week do you know what i have been loving this for longer than this past week Mm. full disclosure Mm -hmm. but that is the outlet smart her news i hope yes right yes and which i told you to follow and i actually yeah and i actually saw it recommended by so many other friends that i have on instagram and so when i finally checked it out i was just really impressed so smart her news is a news outlet founded by a woman named Jenna Lee. She is a journalist, producer, writer, and 
from what I can see, just an all around amazing woman. Mm -hmm. (laughs) After working in the industry for several years, she really wanted to take the news deeper, so to speak. And she saw a need for context and connection when presenting the news that was lacking in more mainstream avenues. And sometimes even just because of time constraints, right? Yeah. And so she started Smart Her News with the intention of, uh, and she says this, providing a woman with solid information and then getting out of her way. Mm. (laughs) And I loved this approach to the news. So one of the things that I love about the philosophy behind Smart Her News that they say on their website is that quality shows respect. And when I started watching her daily reports on Instagram several months ago, that is really how I felt when watching their reports. Like, I feel like she's treating me like an equally mm-hmm. intelligent human being, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> that's capable of thinking on things. Yeah, wild. Yeah, yeah, and it, that it strives to be unbiased mm-hmm. in its reporting. Um, and I think, too, just as someone who has worked also in the news and journalism industry, like I did all through college, I know how essential it is to uphold that neutrality, but I also know how difficult it can be sometimes. So I really respect that about her. Okay, that's going to do it for us this week. If you want to get in touch and chat with us about our topic today, you can find us on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com or leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at The Modern Lady Podcast. I'm Michelle Sachs, and you can find me on Instagram at MM Sachs. And I'm Lindsay Murray, and you can find me on Instagram at Lindsay Homemaker. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.